to uh, first of all give God the very best praise and worship that we can. Number two, we want to preach the word of God so that the people of God can be edified in the things of God. And then we also want to preach the gospel so that anyone who may be lost may come to know Jesus as Savior tonight. Amen. 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 We're going to have a great time with the Lord. So happy for this wonderful partnership. The first of all, I'm sure will be many. And let's get ready to worship. Let's yes, the wing for all that you've done. Amen. Amen. Beloved, we're going to continue on with our worship, with our call to worship. Amen. To the bulletin. And I will be the leader, and you will be the people. Amen. If you're ready, say amen. amen. What shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits to me? I will lift up the of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our God, we do love you and bless you. We thank you that we are uh, in the midst of a presence, in the presence of a God who does great things. Uh, even great things that bring us together as, as one people, under one name, under one Lord, under one salvation and one baptism. Thank you, God, for this wonderful meeting tonight. Father, we ask that you would come and sit with us, take the privileged seat in our hearts and in our worship, and you will receive all the honor, and glory, and praise, and we might be blessed by being in the presence of a God who can do anything but fail. Thank you, Lord. We give you honor, glory, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We'll be led in a hymn uh, with our uh, worship leader, Rebecca. Hallelujah. What a sing. Please stand.
Well, Father our God, we want to thank you that as we confess our sins, your word says you are faithful and just to forgive us all of our sins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Father, we're grateful today that our forgiveness is assured by the payment of the blood of Jesus Christ. And we're justified by his resurrection. We, we leave this confession time, Lord God, fully forgiven, justified, and there is no condemnation because we are in Christ Jesus. Yes. Thank you for the assurance of the forgiveness of sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands, and he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Amen. 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 The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. And I think now we're going to have a musical offering coming from some, some people that, that, that I know very well. The Solomon of the Eastern Baptist Church Choir. Amen. 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 Good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting us. This is a small part of the choir. We're going to do a little something here. If you want to use the platform, you can. If you want to use the platform, you can.
I don't know that they do that anymore. I understand that that's been cut out, right? But he was, it was back in that day, and the, the band was to march in one of these parades, and so we were brought backstage, which was a big deal because there was, again, another nicely dressed young man in a Disney uniform that said to us, very politely but very directly, no pictures. You, you are not allowed to reveal what's happening backstage because all of that stuff is happening that isn't very glamorous it doesn't look very magical in order to make the magic kingdom happen no pictures now uh, i wonder if uh, in comparison you have ever been to the grand canyon and there's a picture of it yeah the grand canyon and now the first time i i visited i've i've had the, the honor to, to go a couple of times but the first time I went, uh, I was leading a student mission trip. We were uh, a, a bunch of about 40 high school students and adult chaperones, and we were going to go do some home repair ministry in the Navajo Indian Reservation there in the, sort of the northeastern corner of, of Arizona. And we included some time to go see the canyon, because you have to when you're in Arizona. So... Uh, the interesting thing is that when most people come to visit the Grand Canyon, you enter in <coughs> to the South Rim. That's where all of the uh, sort of the, the welcoming parts are. Lots of uh, states and state and national parks have this. So there's a there's this distinct human presence in this natural wonder. There are park rangers and toll booths and snack bars and and interpretive centers and all of that sort of thing. And so I'm in youth pastor mode at that time. I'm counting heads, I'm barking commands, you know, I'm doing all of this stuff to make sure that my, my little group of 40 high school students make it home alive. <laughs> and so I'm so busy doing all of this that I literally stepped up to the rim of this vista, or one very much like it, uh, by surprise. And, and I, I had to stop. I had to stop being the leader and commander of this group of 40 kids and just take in the truth and the grandeur, the immensity of, of this thing. Now, you're looking at a picture of it now, and, and I have to say, it looks like a painting compared to the reality. Sorry about that. Compared to the reality of this immense thing. Everywhere you look, there's another whole world of grandeur to take in. It, it's unfathomable how immense the Grand Canyon is. Now, I, I bring these places, Disney World and the Grand Canyon, to your attention to ask this question. Do you think, would you guess, that Jesus is more like Disney World or the Grand Canyon? Think about that for a moment. I know it's a strange comparison, but think about it for just a second. Which is Jesus more like? The, the reality of <coughs> Disney World, when you get close, when you look behind the scenes, kind of behind the curtain, like uh, the Wizard of Oz that hides behind the curtain to make all of that thing happen, when you look behind the curtain at Disney World, you discover how they manage food and trash and lights and costumes and all of those sorts of things. You discover that <coughs> the Magic Kingdom isn't magic at all. It's just a very finely tuned machine of logistics and people to make this, this very fun thing to happen. But when you get close to the Grand Canyon and you see its reality, it is far more grand than you could imagine. Right? The Grand Canyon is 277 miles long. It's 80 miles wide in some places. It's over a mile deep in some places. It started for it forming more than five million years ago. And so when, when you get upon it, it is a challenge for your brain to process all of that, to believe what your eyes are telling you. Now, here's, here's why we're getting to this. When we consider this Christian doctrine that we call the incarnation, <clears throat> the incarnation of God says that in the person of Jesus Christ, the vastness, the immensity, of the God of the universe has come to dwell with us on earth. It is far more grand and beautiful than we could ever imagine. The, the doctrine of the, of the incarnation tells us that the full character, the full identity, the full power of God is made fully present in the human being known to human history as Jesus Christ. Just a couple of verses to, uh, to think about that with here. In the beginning of the Gospel of John, we read this about the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
He was in the beginning with God, and then skipping down to verse 14, and the Word became flesh in Jesus Christ and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Uh, also here in Colossians chapter 1, uh, we read here at verse 19, that in him, in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and get this, this <coughs> we're going to get to this part a little later on, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Okay? So the upshot of this is that when we know God through Jesus Christ, we begin to personally, for ourselves, discover and experience and be in relationship with the majesty, power, grace, love, and mercy of God. This is immense. This is unfathomable. It reaches out to us and into us, into our lives to change us and to transform us. And, and sometimes as we receive these things, all we can do is call it a mystery because it's, it's more than my puny little brain can understand at, at any one point. There are, sometimes there are glimpses of it and, I, and it makes my body shudder to think of it. This means that we can only come to fully know God, to really experience God by faith because as we try to know him like we would know about, I don't know, chemistry. My wife is a chemistry teacher. You know, we just can't understand it all. And sometimes when we have these experience of, uh, experiences of God, it's called an epiphany. An epiphany are those interactions that we have with the Lord, who is always present, but when, for some reason, in us, he feels particularly close. It could be a healing that is an epiphany for you, or a, a new understanding of, of how God loves you, that could be an epiphany, uh, some, some particular blessing, some, some unmerited favor in your life where you know God is, is close and, and present. You can, you can sort of sense it. These glimpses uh, of, the, of the love and nature of God are epiphanies. Those are those moments when our faith has sight and, and we understand something new. Moses at the burning bush. Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. Paul on the Damascus Road. These are some of the Bible's examples. Now, one of the things that is among the historical events of the Gospel is the night that we read of tonight from John chapter 13. And it's on this night that includes the, the celebration of the Passover meal, uh, the Seder meal that Jesus hosts for his disciples, uh, here in the middle of the Gospel of John associated with this passage is also the high priestly prayer that Jesus prays, not just for those original 12, but for you, his disciples. He prays that prayer for you. He gives the promise of the Holy Spirit. Um, and it's also on this night that Judas resolves to betray Jesus. A lot going on there. And there's foot washing as well. Now, foot washing is something that we don't do as a um, matter of course in regular life today. Uh, but in the time of first century Palestine, in the time of Jesus and his disciples, it was a matter of cleanliness. It was a matter of hospitality that a guest's feet would be washed as they entered a home. And so in the, person, in the home of a person of means, there would be a servant who would do this. But among the regular folk, like Jesus and his disciples, uh, they would often take turns to do it for one another. And this night, there's something a little different here. In that, during supper, Jesus, their rabbi, their master, gets up to wash feet. Okay? Now, one of the interesting things about this, it's a little different in the New King James than it is in the ESV, uh, but here in the ESV, it, it points out that it was during supper that he gets up. He gets up from supper. You know, they're, they're passing the potatoes, and Jesus gets up and starts washing feet. What is going on with that? Why? Well, Jesus knew there was something important happening in the room, and it was more than just the Seder meal. It was more than just the food. There is something going on here. Uh, now, there's a conjecture. There's a couple of scholars, Bible scholars, who would suggest that 
the disciples might have been having one of their conversations again, like the one that's here in Luke chapter 9, where an argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. <laughs> they would sometimes have these knuckle-headed arguments with one another about which of them, you know, they're walking around with Jesus, the Messiah of God, you know, love incarnate, and they're arguing like knuckleheads about which of them is the greatest. Uh, they argued with one another. And some commentators think that they might have been having one of these kinds of conversations on the way to the Passover meal that night. Um, but we also do read here in John chapter 13 that the devil had resolved, uh, it had put it into the heart of Judas to betray Jesus. And so there is a spiritual darkness that is descending upon this gathering. And Jesus knew it. Jesus knew the heaviness in the room. And Jesus takes action. And what action does he take? He washes feet. <laughs> okay? He washes feet. So Jesus, the rabbi and master of this group of disciples, is on this special occasion the one who takes off his robe. He, we get a peek behind the curtain, if you will. There's something about that fabric that's coming off of this guy. He grabs the, the, the basin of water and he attends to the feet of his students. It would have been really unusual that a, uh, a rabbi would do this for his students. You notice that sometimes the, that, uh, that the disciples call Jesus master. And that, that would have been true for other groups of rabbis and their disciples. That it would be abnormal for the rabbi to wash the feet of the disciples. But again, what we see here is this peek behind the curtain. We go backstage with Jesus to see what is really going on in this person. What do we see of him? What do we see of God? That's really the question. What do we see of God in this act? We see a love that is the sovereign power that made the universe, as our ladies were saying, you know, the, the omnipotent God, the God of all power, is willing to wash the dust off the feet of his students, mm -hmm. of his children. <clears throat> now, this seems odd to Peter. Uh, Peter, this is that paragraph that we skipped earlier, so now we're going to attend to this. At verse 6 here, uh, he came, Jesus came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Because Peter gets it. You're the rabbi, I'm the student. You're going to wash my feet? And Jesus said to him, What I'm doing to you now, you do not understand, but afterwards you will understand. And what does Peter say? He said, You shall never wash my feet. That was the wrong thing to say, Peter. <laughs> because Jesus answered him, Unless, or if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Now, we need to be really careful about why Jesus says this. Because whenever we consider Jesus' words and actions, we are given a glimpse into the character of God. Mm -hmm. Right? So certainly God has the authority to judge us. Uh, the, the testimony of the scripture also teaches that God is love and grace, and it is by the means of his love and grace alone made known in Jesus Christ that we are reconciled to God, that we live with him as his children. And so here's the thing that Peter is doing. Peter is insisting on his own agenda for God. God does not do this kind of thing, Peter thinks. And like Peter did, we will have no part of him if we insist on a particular agenda for God. So if we're people who say that we are disciples of Jesus, we must be humble enough to let God be who he is. We can't let our expectations and our assumptions about God try to dictate of him what should happen. Right? He is God and we are not. Mm -hmm. And so when Peter tries to do this, Jesus says things like, get behind me, Satan. Remember that part? Mm -hmm. You will have no share with me. So what we see of the character of God on this Monday, Thursday night is a God who shows gracious, serving love to his children. 
And Jesus does this for the express purpose that we would see it, that it would be an example for us, that we would do just as he has done for us. Now, we are here together tonight not because of what makes us different. Amen? Amen. Okay. We are here together tonight not because of what makes us different. In fact, there's, there's too much of people arguing about what makes people different. Amen. Right? There's too much of people arguing about what makes one person, I don't know, more supreme than another or better than another or, or more important than another. And if we fail to reference ourselves to God, that is to say that I am a sinner saved by grace, if we fail to do this, all we are left with are the differences between us. They will be the only things that matter. You know, myself and Pastor Tom, we might stand next to one another, and I might say, I have more hair than you do. <laughs> and then I might say, yeah, but I'm taller and better looking. <laughs> Those will be the only things that matter. Right? We are here tonight because of what makes us one. Amen. And that is Jesus Christ. Amen. It is only in God that we can know ourselves to be equally children of God. And in Jesus, and only in Jesus, can there be a unity that overcomes all the differences that we see. Amen. 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 Thank you, friends, Amen. for our invitation. We're going to take a moment to sing a song called Come to the Table of Mercy, and, uh, and then we're going to move into our time of the sacrament. You'll see the words on the screen. I invite you to um, that one. that's easier to sing without the mask. Uh, so if you know the song, uh, please join in. We're going to sing it twice together.
And Satan invites those who put their trust in him to share the peace he has prepared. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, eternal God, our Creator. You have given us life and second birth in the Spirit. Once we were no people, but now we are your people. You claim Israel as your chosen nation and raised up the church as a witness to the resurrection, breathing into it life and power. From worlds apart, you gathered us together. When we go astray, you welcome us home. Always your love has been steadfast. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the choirs of heaven and with all the faithful of every time and place will forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. In love with you and in compassion for all, Jesus healed and taught challenged and comforted, welcomed and saved. He formed a community, promising to be with his disciples wherever two or three are gathered, and sending them on his mission of hope and healing in the world. Jesus trusted his life to you, and he went freely to his death, so the world might be set free from suffering and sin. You raised him from death, and raise us also to new life with him. In the power of the Holy Spirit, you send us out to make disciples as he commanded. And so remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this wine from the gifts that you have given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, as a living and holy offering of ourselves, that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ is God. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine. That the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in his name. And we may be one in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Oh God, today, you have called us together to be the church. Unite us now at your table in one loaf and a common cup. Make us one in Christ Jesus. Let your spirit empower the light we share together and ignite our witness the world. With all that have gone before us, keep us faithful to the gospel teachings and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Give us strength to serve you until the promised day of the resurrection. And with the redeemed of all the ages, we will feast with you at your table in glory to Christ. All glory and honor are yours, almighty God, with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church now and forever. As Christ our Savior taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Friends, on the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread and gave thanks to God for it, and then he broke it, giving it to his disciples. He said to them, friends, take and eat. This is my body. It is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. This covenant is sealed in my blood, blood that is shed for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. Each time you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim the saving death 
of the risen Lord until he comes again in glory. Amen. Thanks be to God. Uh, just a few instructions as we're about to share uh, communion. We have been using in, in the era of COVID these little uh, self-contained things. There's two pieces. There's a lighter cellophane piece that will reveal a little, a little wafer of bread. And then when it's time, uh, there'll be a thicker piece that you'll pull. Please pull that very carefully because sometimes they, they move quickly and you'll get grape juice on your glass. We don't want that. So, and, uh, and finally, uh, we'll come from the rear forward, come down the center aisle and back around. Please be careful over there in the back somehow uh, and by the cameras. Uh, and, uh, and once you return to your seat, just hold up tight for a moment and you'll receive further instructions. Amen. So please now come forward for all this ready.
Father, we thank you that uh, we can look forward to the time when you will receive us to yeah. yourself. To be one by one church in glory with you. Father, we thank you. And we, we are so grateful we called your children. Help us uh, from this uh, communion service go out and be witnesses of this wonderful gospel. Uh, we give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We have one more time to sing together. And I just I wanted to let you know that as we were working through the communion call and response, I had my eyes shut. And I just, uh, just praise Jesus because with my eyes closed, I realized we're all the same. I pray that we can go through life basically with our eyes closed to the differences the world will try to put between us. So thank you all for coming tonight. Join me in Rock of Ages Clef for me, and you can stand whenever you get ready.
from Sight Sound Theaters in Branson, Missouri. It's a live stream. There'll be pizza at 6.30. Yeah. <laughs> and so if you'd like to share a meal with us, there's a little sign-up sheet on, uh, on a, a cabinet. Uh, there's peanut butter on one end, and hand sanitizer, and the sign-up sheet on the other. And that's where you indicate that you're coming for dinner. Otherwise, just show up at 7 o'clock. And there's uh, our Easter Family Fun Fair. It's a kids' event. Uh, that'll be from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Saturday. So thank you very much. Go in peace, friends. Amen. 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 Amen.